So obviously, um, it's 25 years ahead and 25 years of me. And what was what was mad is that, that when I think about how hedonistic and how mad that time was, um, we've all got different stories and different angles. And I think that's what made London Records so special. When you think about the story of All Saints, you think about the story of, um, you know, of how that office was and how mad it was. And I think I used to just bowl in there, park my car in any bay, and, and rock it, rock in there through international. And it was only until you told me about when I went told me about Niven's book, I realised how obnoxiously crazy I was because they just bowl through international like without marketing, without a care in the world, with a pit bull yeah. terrier. So, we was uh, we were still the poor relation, I think, at that time, and like I don't think we had many parking spaces. <laughs> I think I think those parking I think those parking spaces were meant to be for phonogram or Mercury, and um we we had to park up the road because we were like the boisterous London records, and you you used to you used to roll in there and like take the MDs space of the other of the other people. But I remember the um yeah the fa the the famous story I recount all the time is um. Because I knew Trenton before, your manager at the time. Yes. And um, and, I, and I worked with Christian Tattersfield. And T Tattersfield at that time was like a, a junior to me. I mean, I was I was like, I think the press office had hired him and he was a bit of a handful, though. So the press office said to me, like, well, maybe you could deal with this guy because he's, he's going places. So he was on my A&R staff. And mm. to be fair, he was like, oh, you know, I know about, I was meant to meet Goldie, but I don't, I don't want to meet him. I'm, I'm basically scared of him. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, no, I know Trenton. No, it'll, it'll be fine. So, yeah, there was that, that great meeting when you came in to play me the record um, and you had your dog with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, 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 what was mad about it was that previously to that, because I came in there with such attitude and I thought, previously to that, I dealt with Rob Manley. I mean, the famous story of Clive Black. And, and it was, you was the only A&R guy that didn't flinch. Exactly. You, that you, sat, you sat there and you played it and you sat in the chair and it was quiet and I thought he either really hates it or he's just thinking that dog and I always remember asking you I mean years ago saying why did you sign him but well you had a pit bull terrier in the room staring at me um but what I do remember was the fact that you said let's just, let's just remind people that that's because you played me timeless and it's 20 minutes long and and um, it's got a long intro for a start. But actually, li listening back to that now, just earlier, I don't think it feels that long anymore. <laughs> I well, think you changed was, the game there. Yeah. It's kind of mad <laughs> when you think about it. What it was, what it was, the, what I designed it for in that way as a as a conceptual record. But it actually seems like normal music now when you listen to it in the context of where we're at. You know, and especially where and people. Are so many. Um, just just going through the album again, you. I mean, everyone calls it a drum and bass classic and a game changer. But um, I mean, you went way beyond drum and bass on that album. You you went back to the, your soul roots. That's that's another reason why I connected with it so much because I was an old soul boy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then we, I remember we hit it off big time because I think you, I was the only A and R guy that you'd met that knew who Pat Metheny was. So, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know what was what was mad is that previously two weeks before. I'd gone to different meetings and I almost thought the attitude was, I felt like it wasn't going to get signed. Me and Rob had made it and I'd made it up in, up in, uh, in Stevenage. And I always felt that I had to, this point to prove by making the record first. And I actually offered it to Playford and said, look, put it out moving shadow. And nobody, everyone was really hesitant with this mad Tom, this mad idea of it. And it was kind of like, you know, I offered it to Rob and he's like, you can't handle it. And of course, Reinforced were like a, a smaller label then. No one knew what to do with it. Yeah. But what was what was insane about it, I felt, was that the was that going there with his attitude, thinking it was almost not going to get signed, but it was like the middle finger to the industry. Because two weeks earlier, I'd gone to people like Rob Manley and they sat there and they've gone, uh, yeah, and they're sitting there and it's like three minutes in, four minutes in, and they start to kind of twirl the chair. And then they get really uncomfortable and they start moving to the roller decks and a set of cassette tapes that of all the earlier demos they'd had. And then it's like a gunslinger, I'm waiting for them to flinch. And of course, they fold like a pack of cards and reach for the volume and turn it down and go, okay, thank you, um, we'll be in touch. And I'm like, you're not the person for this album. And I always felt that when we had that meeting and you listened to the whole thing, and I, I always remember your office the way that it was with the blinds. I came in, the dog came in before me, sat on the chair, I sat down. And then, you know, we just kind of tweaked the blinds and everyone's heads turned towards your office. And then we had it a full whack in the office. I mean, that was probably a really big day for me because obviously 
that was just after that, you know, it was it was kind of history. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a famous thing about A and R people. I mean, I've read, I've read, you know, I, you know, I came through an amazing time where I still was kind of in touch with some of the legendary proper A and R people. I would say, and I used to read a lot of books. And I, I mean, uh, there's a there's a famous story Anna Ertigan used to say about. Um, you know, how he signed people. And it's like, you know, everyone thought he was a genius. He said, no, not really. Like some days you just get up and you, and you bump into the Rolling Stones, you know? <laughs> and I, and I, and I had always had this thing where like my Mick Clark, bless him, who passed bless away him. a few years ago. I mean, he signed soul to soul. I always wanted to sign soul to soul. You know, he, he signed, he was, he was at Virgin when Ashley signed Massive Attack. I always wanted to sign Massive Attack. Ended up signing Smith and Mighty. I mean, I was always, I always felt I'd like missed out on like those important <laughs> artists. So when you walked in my office, as mad as a fucker as you were, <laughs> I just felt, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> like, <laughs> he just walked in my office with like a pretty important record. Like, and I don't know what sense we're going to make of this, like in the charts or financially, but I do know one thing that this is, this is a really amazing record. So that's, like, yeah. Well, the other thing about it was... that we bumped into each other. <laughs> I know, but what it was mad about it was it was a 21-minute record, and we had to... Ex it was about how to how to reverse engineer it, because how do you... You know, like, we've got to take a single out of this. You yeah. know, we had to chop... Yeah, I don't think you really wanted to do it at the time. I, I think we went oh, through yeah. all those... It was, jumped through those hoops. Yeah, but I guess I guess I guess the the, the the most one of the most important story, apart from all the support that you showed me on the on the record, on the concept album, was was a story because I think it was on a Thursday, and we'd <laughs> had a few meetings on a Thursday, and I'd been at Clive Black's down right. at Kensington. I wasn't with his record company. I always forget Clive Black's well, record company. Warner's at that point, probably. It was Warner's, and we'd gone into Clive Black's and had this meeting, and Clive Black had shook my hand. And it was like, great, you know, I'm going to sign the album, fantastic. And it was like, yeah, I had the meeting. And I felt something in the back of my mind just wasn't quite right. And I remember getting the call on Thursday after, late in the afternoon, and you said, look, Trenton had pushed for two albums firm, which is kind of unheard of at the time. And I think you were getting spanners thrown at you from, you know, we're going to sign this. Gracie, Roger. <laughs> for two albums firm. And we met in England's Lane on Friday morning. Do you remember that? Opposite oh, yeah. Nelly Hooper's house. Yeah. And it was at Maria's old cafe. And yeah. we... We, we went in there and, and just did the deal at about 8.30, like, we're going to do this. Let's get the contracts ready. It's called David Glick, who was the lawyer at the time. Yeah. And uh, I always remember that... Who, who, who became my lawyer, actually? Did he become your lawyer? There you go. There you go. So the idea of... Uh, and there's another story with, with David, which is in, it was interesting. But what was amazing about it was that I had to go back to... to Clive Black was furious. It was like... you. You see, you, we had a deal. We, I said, you guys make deals all the time. You always shake hands. That's what the record industry is. And, he, and I said to him, listen, listen, man, seriously, stop it. I said, listen, have you heard of Elmer Fudd? He goes, what do you mean, Elmer Fudd? I went, you shot the wabbit, but you didn't see the wabbit was dead. You know what I mean? <laughs> I shot the wabbit, I shot the wabbit. I signed timeless, I signed timeless. But you didn't see the rabbit. The rabbit just got up, yeah. walked out, <laughs> and got two characters instead of one. So, you know, that was that was that. And I think the, the other thing moving on from that was the fact that you believed in the record. And of course, you know, it was I think Kill Your Friends was bang on the money when you think about the, the, the you know, the idea of that second difficult album. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But going back to time, there was a lot of um, I mean, it's. Yeah, there's a lot of humour in that book and, and and a lot of exaggeration. But obviously, there are some things that were quite poignant. I mean, I remember, yeah, the second album of like you go, you go, we got us going through the whole craziness of the first album. And I think you and I were, I, I don't know if it's politically correct to admit it, but we we both thought we were going to do something with the Mercury Prize for, because it was like the first, and then, yeah. and then we did. And then we didn't get it, and then your 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 old mate from Bristol got it the year after, which we yeah. which was great. But we thought maybe we it was should wait for the music. But I felt it was like I don't know whether it was someone had fucked up in the office by 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 submitting it or the date or something was with the no, date. Yeah, something, something was wrong. It was wrong. a bit of real technical technicality. But of course, people. You went, you went. You went. I think a lot of things happened to you subsequently after Timeless came out, like just in your life and like. You know, you you became this larger than life character, um, particularly on the London scene um, as mm. well. And then, we, yeah, oh. then we sent you. Then we sent you up. I remember you wanted to go residential for the second album. And I, I, was it that Rich was, Farm? 
Rich Farm, yeah, Rich Farm. But I, I always, I, I think, we've all got back to Simon's. One of the, probably the most, the funniest thing, which why I called called you and said, give me his number. And you said, what, you're not going to do anything to him, are you? I says, mate, I want to thank him. Was the idea of, I think it was Schroeder. You played Schroeder in the book. And he said, he goes, after, after two caravans. No, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm at Pete. I don't know, because he, he uses me by name, but then the guy, I'm, I'm obviously the guy that has to go down to Ridge Farm yes. to take Laurie Cokel and Colin Bell or whatever it was to, to listen to Mother and like, you know, that, that crack that if you thought, if you thought <laughs> in the city life, that time it, it was, was something like, check this out. And then the intro of Mother's like an hour long. Oh, it, was, it was like, it was like it was, I think the paragraph said something like, after, after two caravans go down there and DJ Rage extends his hands like yeah. marbles darting around his cocaine head. As he turns around, 14 minutes in, Schroeder knows that he's a, a swilling his wine around in his glass, knows that his job is well and truly over. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But, but you mean that, I mean, that was, that was me again doing what I, I, I wanted to do and, and what I believed in. And I think, to be honest, I, I actually also believe that the album was just way too ahead because, you know, when you think about Glastonbury, somebody dropped out and we got Glastonbury. Yeah. Um, and that was at the triangle stage, like at the dead of night. And I've, I've gone online, trying to find it. it. Doesn't exist, you can't find it. Goldie playing Glastonbury. You've been, you've been, you've been wiped out. <laughs> been wiped out, you know, I've just broken the internet. But I mean, the, yeah. the idea of, of touring it, and I think we got very lucky with the Bjork tour, of course, because obviously we were dating and everything else. Um, and even more. Oh, so Goldie, 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 mate. Go on, the, best, the best one. It's probably my, my, my best rock and roll stories, actually. Go on, got, it, it's off again. American, no, you got the American tour with Jane's Addiction. Oh, shit. <laughs> and, and that meant I could come over to America. And, like, do you remember I rented a Porsche? <laughs> I think I rented a convertible Porsche because I wanted to go up and down the West Coast with you and Perry Farrell. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Oh shit! So I was responsible for you while you're now living in LA, probably. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I, I go past the comedy store now and everything like. No way! I mean, because that, that was—I mean—that time of of when you think about when Timeless made the Mobos and he won Best Album, and I—I I don't even know that he even had a category for Best Jungle. It was their idea of. And it was, I think there was three people in that category. It was like a given yeah. who was going to win it. I mean, it was yeah. M beat me and someone else. But the idea of the best album thing was I think I was, when, when it won the album, I was probably still in the toilets getting off my tits. And I'd just come come back and got this other award. I'm like, yeah, great, love to Grove Rider and Fabio. But what was, it, what was mad about it is that you think about the context. It was up against Destiny's Child, George Michael, Jamaraquai. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, go figure that out. It, it was like the changing of the guard of the music, I think, which is important. But it was it, it was at a time when, you know, even when the tour with Jane's Addiction, I mean, we were doing these stadiums with Jane's Addiction. Yeah. And I remember Tim the Bass getting like water and bananas yeah. thrown at him. Like yeah. he was a football player, like a black football player. You know what I mean? Because he's this black guy on bass with dreadlocks and people throwing yeah. bananas at him. Like, get out of fucking Jane's Addiction, man. And then it was, you know. Well, just think, think about what you were playing as well. Is that, it was just like, people, I mean, I don't know if they caught up now, let alone then. <laughs> I mean, it was just space age music. I mean, it was because you think about it was that nervous thing where certain places, I think it was like Portland or, you know, or San Francisco, kind of, you know, was work was kind of working. But then these places where they weren't used to this kind of long intro of like, you, you know, and you, you're trying to keep this kind of theatre of the introduction of the Timeless, and you just get this guy, you know, in the middle of it. It's a little bit like that 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 scene from that story from U2 when, when he, you know, he, you know, he, he, Bono swings the guitar over his back and goes, every time I clap my hands, a baby dies. Goes, Keep fucking playing then. You know, it's like, you know, the idea of, of, of this silence being broken by some heckler would yeah. always kind of throw it, kind of make us really nervous on stage. And uh, it was a mad time for how I think that that album was. And I, I listened to the remasters. Um, I've been, tw you know, and, and, it's, and the mistake I didn't want to do in sobriety and being really like grounded was do what all of these kids do is just smash the album to bits. It, it, it's a record in its own world of crossing analog in this digital bubble. And it didn't need much. It just needed to be enhanced. I think the only tune that I, I really enhanced was really Sea of Tears. 
and, 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 and listening now um, to how important Sea of Tears is, um, yeah. especially with the fact that it's Jamie's voice who's, who's now still doing his last term in prison, you know, as right. a grown man. You know, yeah. he's done, he's done like, 20, right. he's done like 20, you know, 20 years solid. And he, oh, when, you, when you think about, I hear that, that young boy's voice inside the record, in the yeah. middle of the record. And I'm in this place and I recorded the scene in Miami. So, so I think that record is even more a Pat Metheny record yeah. now than, than, than then really. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, well, I think it's, also just reminding people, you know, we're talking about 1995 and you probably made it in 94, right? 1994. Yeah. I remember going with you to Rob's flat. Like it wasn't even a house. Well, it was a house, but it was, it was like- It was in Stevenage, yes. It was, and it was like upstairs, like in, the, in, a, in a bedroom. And I mean, it, I mean you know, DAWs were in their infancy, if, if even around that. I mean, the way it was so complex what you did and in, in, in such basic kind of equipment. I, mean, I know later you got, we got into bigger studios, but at the beginning, a lot of that was done on-, well, on well, S1000s just came out. Yeah. And and I spent my university days, um, when I say university, with reinforced at Dollis Hill, and and I and I really see that as my you know it was Mark and Digo, and it was the yin and the yang. When you think about things like Angel and the way it started with this, you know, it was Diane. Let God God rest her soul. I mean Diane. If it wasn't for Diane, I mean this album wouldn't have took flight because in a city life. You know, we wrote that together and the way she went out for a walk and came back and she goes, I've got this great line here. And I'm like, I've got this other great idea. And it was, it, it was weirdly enough, the, the, the way that I wanted to create the record that slowed down time. And if you yeah. listen to it, it would seem like it was 10 minutes. Yeah. And, it, and it kind of did that in a lot of ways. And even now, it, it seems even more poignant that but, but Diane's voice, it wouldn't have been what it was without Diane, God rest her soul. Um, and of course, you know, I spoke to Justina Curtis, who, who was obviously the keyboard player and she did the chords on Adrift. And she was saying that, you don't remember how we did Sensual because Diane was supposed to do it. And you had a massive argument with the guy on the motorway to cut you up and you stopped the car on the motorway, stopped the traffic and got out. And there and Diane are in the car going, oh my God, what's she doing? Because we're having an argument. And I got back in the car and me and Diane was screaming at each other. And Diane says, why that's it, I'm off the fucking tour. And it was, it was, it was, it was really so, you couldn't have written it, the, the, the events that happened. I mean, look and circumstance of meeting you, the, the idea of getting it ready to go on tour, going to rehearse at, John, at Henry's, at John Henry's, trying to get this whole machine done. And I think the first live thing we did, if you remember, was the word. Yeah, yeah, well, the I, word. And I seem to remember we did that place in Kilburn, didn't we? That was your test. Wasn't that the first public yeah, show? Yeah, the first public kind of show. And and I think the idea of getting, you know, you've got Mel Gaynor, which is another intrinsic, in, an yeah. intrinsic part of it. When you think that studio in St. Anne's Court between Wardour and Dean, yeah. you know, I'd go there to meet Mel Gaynor, to, to, you know, I've got this, to meet him about drumming on the album. And of course I open the door and on the first floor is David Barry's picture with the trilby. From, from 1977. And of course, space, I mean, I saw people there in London about a year ago, all gathered around in, in, that, in that alleyway doing a tour. And it was all these Japanese and tourists. And it was, of course, Space Oddity was recorded there. I went, you want to put a Goldie Timeless plaque up there just underneath him? <laughs> 